Welcome to Epicenter, episode 490, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with my trusty co-host, Felix Luch. And today we're talking with Ryan Zurer. He is the founder of Dialectic and also a super early Epicenter listener. He's an OG Epicenter listener, one of few uh, that I've stuck around all these years and was on the podcast, believe it or not, 250-ish episodes ago. Uh, so about half of the life of Epicenter. But uh, yeah, so today we're going to be diving deep into a whole bunch of topics, uh, including NFTs, uh, psychedelics, and maybe talking about some investment strategies a little bit. Uh, beyond that, we'll also talk about DeFi and uh, you know, what he sees uh, coming coming down the pipe in the future. Hey, Ryan, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks very much for having me. And, you know, as I mentioned before, uh very sincerely, thank you for all the work that, that you guys have done over going on a decade now. Um, I remember that Epicenter became a, an outlet for me, I, I think around the 2014 era, in in recognizing that like, ah, this Bitcoin community wasn't really the thing that I was after and that there were other people who were who were thinking about things beyond Bitcoin and and how this technology could be used. And you guys were really the leaders in... In going beyond Bitcoin, you know, at, at that time it was called Epicenter Bitcoin, and 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 then you generalized it, and that important ecosystem building, uh, I, you know, I can't overstate how how fundamental that has been to to the growth and the education of the space overall. I'm so very grateful for for this work that you've done over all these years. Oh, thanks, thanks for saying that, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it has been almost ten years. It uh, sometimes. Uh, difficult to fathom how how yeah, long you guys been. should throw like a huge party for the, for the decade and like have I don't know all, all all kinds of guests come or something like that do a big live like multi you know uh uh like multi person podcast or something it'd be great it's important right the, the work that you guys do is really important no thank you um yeah but uh so you were on in two thousand and eighteen on episode 249. So maybe for our listeners who aren't familiar with your work or, you know, who haven't been listening for as long as you have, can you give us a bit of background about yourself and, uh, you know, how you got here? Sure. Um, actually in November, I celebrated a decade in the game myself, you know, early investor in Ethereum, MakerDAO, Polkadot, Filecoin, Definity, File, or, um, Solana, Near, Rowdy Capital, um, Axie Infinity, many others. Um, I came into Polychain Capital um, in the weeks after Olaf uh, founded the company and led a lot of the early stage uh, private investments at that time. Um, we created a document called SAFT, um, and, and that was a really good, um, a really good mechanism that that we use and I continue to use. And so at this point, I think what I'm most known for in the space is having been at the eye of the storm of all three major cycles. So mining in 2012, 2013, you know, ICOs and SAFs in 2017, and then Plater and Gaming and, and NFTs in 2021. Um, been grateful to just be in the mix and uh, and be doing my thing all these years. Um, just love it and um, couldn't imagine anything else. Crypto is a strange addiction. Yeah. How, how did you, um, I don't remember the story there, but how did you uh, meet Olaf and, and become a partner at, at Polychain? <laughs> I'll tell you the real story, uh, which I don't think I've ever mentioned publicly. I was talking with Pantera about putting investment into them. And I said, I'll, I'll make an investment in you guys if you make an Ethereum fund rather than a Bitcoin fund. And this is in 2015. And they literally scoffed at me. They're like, Pff. and I was just like, you know what? Like, <laughs> I'm going to go and do this. And so the DAO came up and I participated very expressly in the DAO, um, was fortunate to be, to be called by, by Jordi Bellina on a strange day um, to, to contribute to the, the DAO white hack attack. And then after the DAO blew up, I was like, okay, well, I was going to work as a venture you know, partner for the DAO. Um, this didn't work out. So I went around and, and looked for who are the smartest people doing, you know, 
venture style crypto investments because I had been doing some angel stuff. I had already written a check to MakerDAO and and obviously put into the Ethereum crowd fund a bunch of others. Um, and and met Olaf and we we hit it off right away. Um, and uh, you know and and we got going with with Polychain and you know that that's an example of something that what you look for in startups is for what I call a, a company getting slippery where it's growing at a pace that you kind of can't keep up with. Um, and we felt like that in, in Polychain. There was this one moment, I think it was actually the Bancor um, ICO, where we had just passed 100 million AUM. And it was just two of us in, a, in an apartment in San Francisco. And these guys raised $100 million. And we looked at each other. We were like, geez, these, this is probably five people in an apartment who just raised all this money. This is crazy. Then we kind of looked at each other and realized like where we were and what we were doing. And we're like, oh, okay, back to work. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it was it was a really fun time. Uh, we remain good friends, um, but I'm I'm happy to be doing what I'm doing with Dialectic. Um, you know, automating yield in in market neutral, uh, and uh, and just taking a very uh, programmatic approach to to investing in the major categories of crypto. Um, here in Switzerland and being here in Switzerland, I think is, is starting to pay off as a, as an important strategic decision. Yeah, we, we definitely want to get into that a bit. I think for me personally, one of the first things I think I read from you was around like keepers in, in blockchain networks. I, I see you like sort of evolved that topic over time. Can you maybe explain to us a little bit, you know, what, what you were thinking about there and maybe also how it, your view has changed since I think initially you were thinking about this like in 2017 and obviously we're like six years later now. So yeah, curious what your current thoughts are. So originally we were thinking about that in terms of MakerDAO because I, I co, co rewrote the white paper with, with, with Rune and Amandi um, and, and Nikolai, um, and shout out to Nikolai who, who we tragically lost last year. He was so important for our space and, um, I miss him tremendously. Uh, and it, you know, because we were generalizing beyond just Bitcoin and mining, I started to think about it in terms of, okay, there's a resource provider layer that provides some important resource. And then there's a user layer that uses this resource. Um, you know, one of the better examples or, or cleaner examples to describe is Filecoin, where that instead of mining or transaction confirmation, it's storage that is the resource layer. And that's like the keepers. And in DeFi, it wasn't called DeFi at that time, but in, in, in liquidity networks, in financial networks, the key resource is liquidity provision. Um, so people who provide the market making and liquidity are kind of like the miners of a of a, of a liquidity network, but we didn't really want to call them miners. Um, so keepers became the term, uh, that came up in a, in a long late night conversation between Nikolai and I, uh, and that, and, and really it was just about describing these networks as the resource provider layer and the user layer and the user layer is subsidized by the inflation that the resource provider gets over the bootstrapping era which we're kind of coming to the end of in, in Bitcoin, but we can see we're still in the bootstrapping era of many other resource networks. And this can be applied to, to many, many things beyond just, you know, financial transaction verification, like in, in Ethereum and Bitcoin, you know, Filecoin with storage, but I think there's a, a good argument that it could be done with ISPs, with energy networks, with, you know, anything that was a marketplace can be turned into a protocol with these two layers where the user layer is subsidized. And that's ultimately the, the concept of keepers is, is that there's a, there's a resource provider that subsidizes the users to get the service for free or nearly free. How has your thinking evolved then? Like from when you wrote those first articles, uh, which I believe was a couple of years ago, ha has that thesis changed over time uh, now that, that resource providing networks are, are a little bit more mature and and also since these networks are no longer operating in isolation and increasingly in, uh, operating in in a sort of network of their own right with interoperability i think like if you broaden the definition enough we actually see it continue to replicate 
um, with fairly high fidelity. So for example, the newest types of networks that we see are in play during gaming, um, where the resources incidentally are eyeballs playing a game and they are subsidized by inflation of an underlying token with that game. So the first example that we saw of that with success was Axie Infinity. Um, and, and generally I just think that that's a really powerful, like fundamental mechanism of crypto is that we can use inflation over uh, a period of time to bootstrap network effects. And then once network effects kick in, we can modify the, you know, the economic trade-off such that transaction fees are, are, are more paramount and, and it's less about inflation. So I think as games, games evolve, what we're going to see next is we're going to see zero sum, right? Which I've actually been wanting for a while. So today it's, it's inflationary. So if I play you in a, in a play during gaming context, uh, you know, and you win, I don't lose, you just win. And, and the cost is socialized across the whole network via inflation where it's going to flip is, is you win, I lose. Now, there are some questions of whether that run, runs into to gambling and gaming regulations and things like that. And I think, you know, we'll sort the, those out over time. Um, but I'm actually quite encouraged that the general concept of keepers um, continues to, to, you know, be relevant in the space. There's been, uh, you know, I see it be used uh, all the time, which is really heartwarming. Like there's been like DAOs called Keeper DAO and Keeper This. And so it's, it's been nice over time to to see that and see other things that that I've tried to make a contribution to the space in um, be relevant and, and, and be used by by folks. And so it's great. Right. I, I think, I mean, yeah, maybe you would be curious to hear, I guess, you know, like actually Infinity was successful, I guess, for a little bit in the bull market and sort of the engagement, I guess, dropped off. Do you... So you, you think that's going to change in like future future iterations or like sort of where do you do you think maybe these first play to earn uh, games sort of failed or what's 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 their thing? Yeah, so I think the lesson learned that we take away from from Axie is um, and just to be clear, it's like it's a lot of the same lessons that we that we've had in previous you know iterations in, in crypto is that that crypto economic design um, is really important and changing it in the middle of the, the road can be catastrophic. I, you know, the allegory that I would use is, is that in layer ones, the crypto economic design of the initial team distribution and how rewards are doled out over time, either to validators or, or to team or to community or to investors, Those can, those decisions can be catastrophic to a project. I was part of the debate uh, around Ethereum's choice where they ended up going 9.9 to team, 9.9 to foundation. And I thought that that was a great precedent. But then we saw many other projects deviate from that precedent over time and really do themselves a gigantic disservice. You know, the, the, you know, they started to be calling VC coins. They lost community uh, from that. And You know, and ultimately these things rest on, on, on a community with Axie, you know, we didn't know, um, how, how these things would we evolve. And, and then the change, I think created a somewhat of a mistrust because I, I think we underestimate the fact that like very literally millions of people were doing this as their job. And there was this narrative of like, oh no, they'll play the game because the game is fun. And I was like, nah, no, it isn't. Like, like they're playing this for a job. And guess what? That's fine. Financial incentivization is okay. And if that means that they're playing a game that they otherwise would not, that's that's fine because you get to bypass the hundreds of millions and even billions of dollars that it would require to uh, to acquire customers, to acquire eyeballs in Instagram ads and TV slots and and all these other things, you just go right to the customer and you say, hey, we'll, we'll incentivize you to pay this game, play this game. And I think that's the powerful thing, not how great the game is. And so what I look for today, you know, we get, we get tons of pitches of like, we're going to make a triple A quality crypto game. I'm like, A, no, you're not. 
and B, uh, you don't need to. You can make a pretty break bones game and just build community, bootstrap that through the financial incentivization. The other thing is, I think games will get more elegant in their crypto economic design. So you have to balance the like, you can't have pay to win where I can just like pay to have like the greatest swords and just like be running rough shot through a game like I'm I'm some kind of monster, right? So the the game play has to be ha- has to be high fidelity to talent and skill. However, you can have economies that kind of support the game in, you know, whether it's like like providing resources or or like re-ups of energy or various things like that where you can make for a more epic experience that is supported by an economy and again that's where you have like user layer and keeper layer right a keeper layer could be like the providers of of resources swords wood whatever it is and they're going around and mining that in the game and consolidating it and selling it in their shop whereas the like the warriors the game players they theirs is is one based solely on skill i haven't seen a model that has completely solved that but the good thing is there's lots of experiments and I'm very confident that we'll solve it as a community over time. So, so one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on was because, you know, you're, you're so plugged into say like the NFT space and also the gaming space. And this is, th- th- these are verticals in crypto that I, I don't have very well formed theses about. And I'm sometimes a little bit skeptical of, of. and, and you, you just said something that sort of opened my mind to this concept that I think, uh, you know, it, it overlaps with a lot of, other uh, verticals in crypto, and that is that uh, intermediary elimination. So essentially, with gaming, you know, as you said, you know, the the um, uh, a game developer can bypass you know the, the 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 intermediaries that they would usually interact with. So like marketing, for instance, uh, in order to or like the, these intermediary costs in order to attract uh, players, but by directly incentivizing players, they don't have to have sort of that like intermediary uh, actor yep. or cost uh, uh, center to to attract the players. They just attract the players directly. And so it's sort of like eliminating the need for for that intermediary, that middleman in the same way that, you know, Bitcoin or other cryptos eliminate the needs for other types of intermediaries. Um, with, uh, with regards to gaming, what do you think is necessary for, say, like this, this style of gaming to have its... Um, it's kind of mass market uh, moment. I, I ask you this because I'm, you know, I, I know folks that works at Ubisoft or, you know, I've, I've, I've talked to say innovation departments there that are looking at crypto and, and from, from the perspective of like traditional game um, uh, designers or, you know, game, game studios, there's this, I think uh, this notion that the business model, the crypto business model doesn't make sense for the economics of of building mass market games that costs you know millions of dollars uh, to produce, um, is is crypto gaming fundamentally you know um, orthogonal to the traditional way that we think about building games, or or do you think there's a there's a middle ground here that that will will that will achieve at some point? I would say my observation in in these interactions with with like Epic and Ubisoft and and certainly like the drama around Discord and things like that is more that, you know, the innovator's dilemma continues to, to prevail and that very rarely the incumbent uh, will be the leader in a new, like in the new up and coming category. Um, you know, this is true across technology uh, in, in so many fields. And so I don't think that, you know, Ubisoft or AAA game manufacturers with, with armies of teams and, and the corresponding drama and politics that are inherent in, in those size of teams will be the ones that, that catch fire here. I think that there, it's easy to dismiss some of the core tenants and the power of, of crypto communities until you see it unfold. And I think that that's what's going to happen. And so like, you know, they say, well, you need all these millions of dollars and, and upfront cost. And, you know, and you have to build, you know, mass market user base. 
It's like, well, you could actually kill two birds with one stone and get, you know, like by funding it through the crowd and getting your community on board, both as users, evangelists, as well as, as you know, asset holders, that's a great way to, to bootstrap all of this together. Um, and, and so crypto uniquely enables that. Uh, the, uh, the other component of, of, of this is I think it would be important to set a, a parameter for what is like mass market adoption. There was a point in 2021 where there's about 480,000 daily active users of Ethereum addresses and about 410,000 daily active users of Axie Infinity uh, Ronin addresses. And, it, it, you know, it, it, it's really inspiring. In fact, it being a, like in the space as long as I, I have been, there's two stories that I find the most inspiring in the history of the space. The one is all the people in the Philippines who were able to, to replace their job by playing Axie Infinity uh, during COVID, right? They, you know, there was no, you know, there's no government bailout or handouts during COVID. Like they had to figure out a way to survive and they, were able to replace their job that they lost in tourism or manual labor by playing this game. And it became so culturally ingrained that like people would buy houses in, in the uh, in-game currency and like the, the like cities were operating using this crypto asset. And I think that that's really important, especially as we see AI, ML, you know, take the world by storm. We're going to have to get real about alternative approaches to, um, to effectively UBI. And, and for me, these games could affect a best first attempt at UBI. Um, and, and we've had glimpses of, of, of that happen. And, and so it, it just to conclude the second really inspiring story. And, and I think that this may be the, the next topic that, that we can discuss are these artists, these digital artists who for so long didn't have a way to commercialize their work. Because if you bought a piece of digital art and somebody copied it, you didn't know who who had the original, who had had the copy, uh, and so there was no like scarcity of it. There was no collectability there. And with the advent of NFTs, these digital artists were able to to commercialize their work for the first time, and 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 that was really amazing. Like I, we saw all these rags to riches stories that in an in an industry that had been broadly based on the speculative use case until now this i found these two stories to be really amazing that 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 artists and the individuals in emerging countries could bootstrap themselves and 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 sort of you know take a step forward and be able to provide just a reasonable income um it you know in the case of artists mike uh you know more commonly known as people he he jokes around that the highest he ever got for an everyday before NFTs was a hundred and ten dollars, right? And th and that's like shows that like crucible moment of digital scarcity conferred rarity to his his work, and then that conferred collectability, and that then conferred value, and and ultimately for for an artist like Mike con conferred really life changing value. Um, and, and those I just find to be really inspiring stories and where I want to spend my time, my capital. So, yeah, let's, let's maybe talk about NFTs a little bit. And, and again, you know, this is a space that I've sort of dabbled in a little bit, like within crypto verticals, you know, like DeFi, NFTs, gaming, et cetera. And, um, you know, I, there, there are moments where, where I felt like, yeah, like this is, this is like super empowering for artists, et cetera, right? You know, like this, this narrative that you, that, that you just expressed. But then there's other moments where I'm like, this is a hot shit show and there's nothing good will come out of this. And, you know, most of this will go to zero. Can you break, break apart, like break down your, your thesis for, you know, how NFTs are, you know, fundamentally like a game changer in terms of how artists express themselves and, you know, how do we reason about what, is actually of cultural significance and what isn't you know i guess i guess like one thing i think about a lot is you know, with 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 the 2016 2017 cycle 2018 you know icos were a big part of the narrative and what came out of that i think you know are things like safs or more 
structured, regulated um, funding mechanisms like CoinList. CoinList, yes, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that you know from from that exuberance uh, came out like these interesting funding mechanisms. Now with NFTs, I don't know that we've yet. I, I, maybe maybe I've missed it, but like I don't know that we've yet really see like what will what 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 will we look back on and say oh this is what the nft uh summer produced right and so yeah maybe um maybe if you want to expand on that yeah it's interesting i think as venture capitalists we we're at peace with a cycle where where 90 something percent of something writes to zero because because that that few percent that survive often go on to be incredibly valuable, um, and so whether it's ICOs, which is a really important funding mechanism, or whether it's you know NFTs, which is a really important representation of digital scarcity for a variety of use cases, and I'll talk about the taxonomy in a minute. I recognize and have gone on record, like in the height of the 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 bull market of both of those, saying, yeah, of course, ninety five percent of these will will go away. And that's fine because the 5% that survive will create such extraordinary value that it won't matter. Nobody, you know, nobody will care. And so I think it's really important to, to separate the taxonomy of, of, of NFTs because as a technology, it has such wide sweeping applications, right? Like today it's being used for, you know, digital art and gaming and and some like social clubs and and you know different thing different things in like that tomorrow it will be your house deed you know your your university uh diploma it, look the nfts will encompass eventually all capital assets um but for for today's taxonomy what the way that we separate it is we look at digital art uh, that is somewhat, and so within digital art, there's some subcategories. So you've got algo art, like Rafik Anadol. Um, you've got, you know, pop culture art, like Beeple. You've got generative art. Generative art is kind of cool because that's where a platform, a artist, and a user come together in in a critical moment to create something that that they've all participated in. That creates a certain bond between the collector and, and that, that outcome. And then, you know, you can kind of go down, down the list from, from there in, in art, but that is different. So digital, fine digital art is different than say gaming assets that are supposed to have utility. And that's also different from what we consider to be social clubs. So something like Bored Apes in its current iteration is more like a social club, right? People are signaling to the world that they, you know, can afford to spend six figures on a on a monkey jpeg and in over time it will it will evolve into being a gaming asset we 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 think and we hope and so those are those are very very different categories and then you know we'll see music nfts which there's been some early experiments on and 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 i think there will be some more we'll see full feature films um you know especially like choose your own adventure films where like you can compose like six NFTs to get one outcome and compose like, you know, 13 to get a totally different film outcome than, than you otherwise would have, um, at, right down the, the line until again, all, all capital assets are NFTs in the digital. So we, we, with one of one, our, our, our collector pool, we focus just on fine digital art. And not only that, we focus just on find digital art that we can interface with museums because our mission is to help digital artists find their rightful place in art canon. Because again, digital artists have been completely dismissed in our, in the art world and art canon for generations in part because there was no collect in large part because there was no collectability of their work and that has changed. And so that's the, the that's kind of the interesting thing in the digital art category. And, and from there, you know, my friend, Amy Capoletto has this very famous, I've been spending a lot more time in, in the art world because just got, you know, hurtled face first into it with purchasing both the Rafik and adult moment piece, as well as, as, as human one by people. And I'm 
you know, met some just unbelievably brilliant people in, in the art world. It actually caught me by surprise how many thoughtful, remarkable people um, spend most of their, their time and, and capital in art. Um, and my friend, Amy Capoletto told me this one piece of advice. She said, look, in all categories of, of art across the ages, only about five to maximum 10 artists survive a decade and matter. And everybody else uh, basically writes to zero. And I was like, that's interesting because that's kind of like venture, right? And so I take a, a venture approach to, to art. But what we see is that upper crust will survive, right? That those very important, these like cultural monikers, these these, um, uh, you know, these things that we we identify as representative of our time, they will survive and be very valuable. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic that 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 both the works of of Rafik and 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 Beeple will will be among that that discussion. But I don't know, you know, and that's why I take a portfolio approach. And we've got more than fifty artists, including um, twenty female artists in the in the portfolio, um, and. And that, I find that that just is really exciting that very clearly digital artists merit being represented in art canon. Very clearly, they have not been properly represented in art canon until now. And that will, that will change and we can benefit and, uh, you know, uh, and capture growth in that regard. So do you think there's like a, a um, also maybe like a, a, a generational component to this? Um, I'll give you like an example that something that happened re recently. Like I, I was in Amsterdam and I went to this, this, this art gallery. It's this place called the Moco museum. And, and they had a bunch of NFTs there. And actually I sent you a picture, right? There was this, there was a people yeah. there and I sent you a picture of it. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so I was, you know, my, my, my fiance and I were like by far the oldest people in this museum. And like, you know, we're in our late thirties. And so, uh, and, um, and there was just like in the NFT room, everybody was like, clamored in the nft room trying to take pictures of the nfts um and then and then we had a very different experience at the ricks uh museum which is like this you know this world famous um it's kind of sort of fine arts museum in 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 amsterdam where you know it's 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 an institution um uh, but you know no nobody's like clamoring to take you know pictures of you know you know van gogh or something or maybe a little bit but like not as much as like this people um so I wonder if there's this, if there's like a, a very kind of generational cultural significance that that this this digital art has to a generation of people that associates more with like this digital component and and this sort of very modern contemporary component. Uh, absolutely, I think uh, this definitely resonates with a millennial and Gen Z audience much more than traditional art. Now. One of the interesting things that have come out from that is museums, major global institutions are recognizing this far faster than we think, far faster than I imagined. Like if a year ago today, somebody would have told me that we'd have a piece in both M plus and MoMA. And by the way, the one in MoMA, the Rafik Anadel is shattering records, has completely broken the record for the longest period of time on average that people spend in front of a work at the MoMA. Like think about it, like, this is the MoMA, like ever, like this is in front of Starry Night, in front of, you know, Water Lilies, in front of all the Picassos, all of everything ever. It, the Rafik Anadal is tracking as, you know, is having the highest engagement. And, and, you know, museums are waking up really fast to, to the fact that this matters because post COVID museums are having to get I think more, more creative about how they get people back to, to museums. And, and as a result, like I, I, what I'm seeing is again, I can't speak broadly across NFTs, but in the fine digital art category, major institutions are filling the hole where the crypto community has, has sort of like lost, lost the narrative and kind of, you know, it, or have sort of, missing the forest for the trees, right? Like we're, we're too many people are worried about like floor prices and airdrops and utility. And we got Pompidou, LACMA, MoMA, you know, M plus like 
all these global institutions acquiring fine digital art NFTs. Like this is a really big thing. And again, if I would have told you this a year ago, you would have said categorically impossible. Like if you know, if you know the art world, you would have said, no way Pompey Do is going to announce a major like collection overhaul, or the MoMA is going to announce the sale of $70 million worth of their all important um, art collection in order to lean into digital, right? Like that's a huge, huge movement. Um, and so again, like that's kind of the thing that I find the most compelling and most interesting and that will, will survive and thrive and create great value over time. Right. I'm, I'm actually sort of curious. I think what you mentioned is super interesting that, you know, we're worried about these airdrops, floor prices. Do you think there's some sort of like, I guess there's a big difference between, you know, bootstrapping a keeper network, let's say, and the way to incentivize and like the, the kind of crowd you, you get. Uh, and, uh, and maybe in the NFT space, like how you become significant is probably like a different mechanism. Do you, or do you see like some overlap of how you would like sort of bootstrap these different communities through the incentivization or is it like, um, something to totally different? Yeah, I think in, in the fine, in the fine art, it's fundamentally different. Um, because it's not about like creating network effects because you have, like scarcity that drives drives the value and 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 you know you you actually don't want like velocity in the in the network so like let's look at you know let's look at a great collection which is both very high quality fine art and um and also has great community in in digital art which is squiggles right snowfro creator of this idea of of this generative you know um trinity that comes together where collectors feel a really deep resonance with that there's no velocity like you can't you know you can't get a a a, a rare squ squiggle like you can offer whatever you want you just can't get it like there's just no like people are like no this is mine and it's always mine and that is kind of what you're looking for in in fine art that's a bit that's very very different than what you'll look for in like gaming or in in other categories And that was, you know, I started out like it being like, okay, I don't know what is going to be cool in NFTs. So like, let's experiment in all the different categories. And then from a collection perspective, kind of narrowed things down over time to focus on fine digital art, even though the fund continues to do a lot of, a, a lot more things in gaming. I think, you know, the size of the gaming space will dramatically eclipse the size of the, the fine art space. Like, you know, gaming will be multi-trillions where, where art will, will, will stay well and in, well into the, to the like low billions. Um, and so those are very different. I think you will see like the, these interactions of bootstrapping and inflation driving things in gaming in fine art. It's, it's a fundamentally different mechanism. Um, the art is the utility, right? Right. Thanks. Yeah. We definitely have so much to cover like topics and like verticals. So like, we're going <laughs> to try to make like a bit of a hard cut here. <laughs> I think I read like on the dialectic website is like says dialectic is a machine that solves ciphers to unlock exceptional value for our members. Can you expand a bit on what that means? So we are a group, uh, built by crypto natives for crypto natives. So the vast majority of our, our members, member families or LPs, uh, are, you know, entrepreneurs that I've done well with over the years or friends in the space. And, you know, and, and there are a set of, of challenges that, that, that you face managing significant crypto wealth. Um, and so everything we do is very crypto native, you know, on chain. And, and we look at the architecture and portfolio construction from, a crypto natives view with an understanding of the nuances, the difference between investing in crypto assets that have, you know, shorter timeline to liquidity, higher volatility, you know, some advantages, some disadvantages that, that you can manage. And then we take a very technical approach to those. And so, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that I think I'm most proud about and, and is very emblematic of what we do is our market neutral fund. So we'll, Every, all of our vehicles are named after Swiss watch complications and our market neutral fund chronograph 
um, which as of today is yielding 18.36% um, annualized. I think that's probably around 4x um, outperformance of, of our peers. And the way that we're able to do that is that we have this software suite called Medici that automates harvesting, compounding. It automates a, a bunch of the the analysis of like how to balance pools, how to balance between, you know, what we've done is we've stacked, taken regular DeFi and on top of that stacked Delta neutral. And then on top of that stacked MEV. Um, and MEV isn't like traditional market neutral, but you can make it market neutral. And it, it sort of pops once in a while when you hit a strat. And that's like, you know, winning a lottery every day for, for a week until it gets arbed away, but it's still good. Um, and the combination of these things and then having a, a software suite that, that delivers more security and, and delivers uh, a programmatic approach of balancing, you know, when DeFi is down, we balance more into Delta neutral. When Delta neutral is not available because of a, a variety of things, maybe we're at more in MEV and more in DeFi. And then we diversify across a wide range of, of pools and having that long tail exposure allows us to put small amounts of money into like high risk and Deegan stuff, which can have really high yields um, without risking going below 0% in a month. So we still remain market neutral up every month, but you can go and take like Deegan risk on some things if you're, if you isolate it enough and if you have the right infrastructure around you. And so that's like, you know, that's the kind of stuff that that we do. That's very crypto native. That's very technically um, driven, and um, and and we're really satisfied with the returns. All right. Yeah, it's super interesting. And I, I guess I wonder: is this something that you have to do like proprietary, or is there also like a way to like sort of build this also fully on chain, or are there like elements that you just because of the I guess MEV nature of it, you, you can like build this into like a network type thing or has, is that something you thought about? So there are parts of it that we do feel compelled to maybe in the not too distant future release to the world for community support. So for example, like, you know, we have the, this thing like bridge watcher and, and also like pool watchers where what they'll do is they'll watch for specific signals and imbalances in a in a pool or a bridge and then automatically remove capital should any of those signals uh, occur uh, and it and does it in multi sigs on chain and like the amount of money that would have been saved by people in in exploits over the last year if you know if the bridge watcher was widely available would have been really significant you know we've seen it play out for ourselves where we've been been able to get out of a pool um, when it was showing these signs and, and, you know, a lot of other people got, got burned. Um, so I think there is a moment where we, we open source some of this because it's just important infrastructure, but then we have to balance it because like, you know, we're not like, we're not a foundation. We don't like, we make money by making money for our members and, and, and ultimately we we have to do that first and foremost and 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 while these things are producing really compelling outperformance on the yield uh, you know we're we feel pretty good with with where that is especially in a really highly volatile market right like people running you know like hedge fund strategies of liquid tokens or even venture strategies I can empathize with with that this is a more a very difficult market to say fundraise in as well as deploy into because of volatility and uncertainty around a whole bunch of different topics like regulation. Um, and so our market neutral feels like just like home base, right? Where we can like revert back to, we know we make great money for our LPs. We know we return great money to our, our, our shareholders as a result. And, and that, that just feels really comfortable right now in this un in these uncertain times. Tell me a little bit more about this this bridge watcher. What kind of things are you looking for uh, in in order to detect you know these these signals? Like what what signals are you looking at to detect when like there's a there, there's a bridge hack going on? And what have what have you learned from that in in terms of 
how these exploits go down. I mean, there's some really like simple ones, just like capital imbalances that you can take. There's a bunch of social signals that you can also uh, be drawing on. Um, there are, uh, it, you know, there's a range. You know, I, I suppose I shouldn't get too far into this, but some of it is sort of a, what, what would be called like a defensive MEV. So you're kind of like MEVing the bridge to not be MEVed. Um, and, uh, and that like that, you know, MEV broadly is, is I, I often refer to as like inception for crypto. It's like math Olympics. And so that, that goes right down the rabbit hole, but there's a bunch of MEV strats that, that, that have second order implications and indications that that are certainly important. And then capital imbalances, um, social notifications, and a bunch of things like that. Because again, like if somebody is draining from the bridge, it's always going to be like one side of the bridge it drains, right? Um, and so if you see a delta in that uh, very quickly, and it's to the negative, right? It's not that somebody's come in with new capital. It's like someone has taken off capital, then that can be a first order, certainly a first order um, signal. And then you can compare it with all of the other signals to then automatically execute the multi-sig transactions to, to remove capital from that pool. Okay. So how, how are you guys engaging in the MEV space uh, more broadly? I mean, you guys have been a pretty prolific uh, participant in, in that ecosystem. What, 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 what types of things are you, are you, uh, are you doing to engage with the MEV space? So my co-founder Dean spun out a separate uh, organization, which we, you know, which we seeded and incubated called Project Blanc. And together with a bunch of math PhDs, they run MEV across a number of different networks. And that is about sort of like building infrastructure that goes beyond the simple sandwich tack. Um, and uh, and he will he will literally shoot me if I if I get too deep in the weeds on on his strats. But um, what I you know what I would say is is that I think it's really interesting because then what we did internally. So he had spun that out. That's been spun out for over a year, um, and they do and they do really well. It's a cash flow business. So it's less of a venture thing, but they just run run great cash flows. Um, and then the funny thing about MEV is. Every new layer one and layer two that pops up presents a new set of MEV opportunities, right? And so, um, the, the people are like, ah, yeah, well, you know, you're going to get ar you're going to get arbed away um, in MEV, and that may be true in Ethereum, and certainly with like Uni V four, I think I think MEV and Ethereum will be certainly a full house at best, and probably just like you know done, not maybe not done, but a very full house very competitive environment. But the thing is, there's so many new layer ones popping up every single day that like you constantly have green fields where you can reapply um, infrastructure in, in other categories. Um, and so we really like what they did, you know, and then what we do is we use some of their, their data and their, their infrastructure to do this defensive MEV in our market neutral. And, and that helps just like pop, pop the yields and take them from, you know, like mid teens to mid twenties in, in this environment when things are going well. And overall, I think it's, it, it's, it, it's an interesting category. You know, I, when, when I explain MEV to people who have no idea about crypto, I often say like, have you read Michael Lewis's flash boys? It's kind of like flash boys for crypto. And if you take it to the second and third order implications, you know, the advent of 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 flash boys and and algo trading at that time ended up making for more efficient markets and i am firmly of the belief that mev makes for more efficient markets in crypto um even though it, and the funny thing is today in the mev space uh, i'm going to preface this by saying uh this is speculation and not confirmed uh rumor but our understanding was the top sort of four players in the space were um, uh, Alameda, um, uh, CZ, uh, Binance, um, who m 
may or may not have been doing very heavy MEV on their own chain, which I think I think there will be a a long discussion about that if that does end up being the case. Um, Justin Sun uh, and uh, and Jump and the t- three of those four are now gone, right? They're out the door. And MEV is something that like accrues to the, and so we were kind of like number five, number six sort of thing. And it's, it's one, it's a thing that accrues to the, to the upper crust, like many things. Um, and so like top two capture the line share, um, on, on a given network. And now that you have the most, like the largest, most resource intensive players out of the game, it's really like, you know, it's a it's a very interesting new day in MEV, I would say. Actually, I, I want to like sort of take it back also to what we said about gaming and like the bootstrap networks. And do you sort of see a world where like these sophisticated actors, I guess, like, you know, MEV participants being like sort of more automated than, you know, like a person playing a game? Do you do you see like an issue there where maybe, you know, all the players end up being bots uh, instead of like real players and, and how... How does that future look like, or is this something that's just like inevitable? Uh, or how can like projects kind of defend against that? Let's say, or so I do think that that will be, you know, that will be uh, a thing. There's a, a a really interesting project called Altered State Machines that makes autonomous agents for player and gaming games, and there are a bunch of other people thinking about that. What my hope is on the other side is that. Uh, Playdown Gaming will represent uh, um, uh, an opportunity for effectively universal basic income, and so people will play against the bots to like to earn, you know, to earn income, and and then like more sophisticated operators will operate the bots, and it makes for this like human and bot interaction that, like you know, like MEV and like other things where where greater levels of sophistication or driving towards efficiency, um, you will have checks and balances in over time, right? So like games will have their version of uni V4 that is like bot resistant, but then at the same time, there still needs to be some bots because there needs to be enough players to play against the, the people and the people need that because again, that's going to be universal basic income, or it's going to be like one of the options for universal basic income. I always am firmly of the belief that the future that we occupy will be much more um, inspiring and frankly better than than the present. And as these things evolve, we will find solutions for them and it will just be better for everybody. Yeah, I, I, I'm also quite quite optimistic that that will be the case. I think that, I, I think it, it, it bears reminding ourselves sometimes just how early we are. And I know there's sort of a meme that says like, you know, people say like, you know, that about, about, about being so early, but we are really fucking early. I mean, there are many people uh, that have interacted with crypto today as there were people on the internet in their, in the, in the late nineties, you know, we haven't crossed a billion users yet. We're far from it. And, um, and yeah, I mean, there's like just so much more ahead of us that I think it's for those of us who've been in it so long, it's it's difficult to remind to like sort of remind yourself that that this is still a very very early space. Um, I want to take a step back a little bit and and maybe bring it up a little bit more high level. Um, you know, given the the gir- the current global geopolitical climate, you know, how has that affected your your thesis about crypto and you know, something that I'm really interested in is how has that affected your how you look at investing in crypto? I start this by saying I would love your your view on this as well. You know, because you're you've been a super smart investor in the space for a long time, and I'm um, and and I really respect your opinion. So, would love love your view on this as well. Generally, I think for the dream of why most of us got into crypto in kind of the 2011, 2012 era seems to be coming to fruition, right? Uh, We got into it because we believed ultimately that the world was going to suffer through a high inflation moment, that the US dollar is maybe the most overvalued asset in the history of the planet and was going to go through a a significant devaluation. And 
in that environment, deflationary assets were going to matter much more than they ever had. It was sort of like return to a, a version of the gold standard once again. And we see this playing out, right? Like this is like happening in front of our eyes um, in this moment. So like broadly, I'm leaning in to the into the market and and very confident that we're up and to the right from here. Um, like, you know, when, it, when we start a polychain, I used to go around saying that um, by 2023, no self-respecting hedge fund on the planet would be without exposure to crypto. And by 2025, no self-respecting capital pool of any kind you know, pension fund or otherwise would be without exposure to crypto. I think I'm a little precipitated on maybe both of those, but by like a year, two tops, I do think that we're hitting the knee of a curve that we've long been waiting for. Um, and, uh, and that's really interesting. However, as venture capitalists, what that means is that our scarce ETH and Bitcoin that we are then giving to a uh, an entrepreneur has to perform even better because we know that, like, I know ETH has a 10x in it. I, I bet the farm on that, right? So that means for the entrepreneur that I give money to, because my, like, my opportunity cost is an ETH, he's got to go out and deliver, you know, 100x or more. And so it has been... It, it, you know, it, 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 it's been making it causing us to, to to pause somewhat and and seek like a more consolidated portfolio of a of, a of, of very high outcome um, possibilities. I would say um, on the venture side, but on with respect to like liquid tokens, I mean, I think I don't I don't a, a collection of just like thoughtful like high quality liquid, you know, liquid assets like Cosmos and ETH and Polygon and Wormhole and a few others. Uh, just like so obvious right now in my view. Um, and I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just a hammer and all I see is nails, but I, I think it's like, I'm more excited in this moment than I think I ever have been in the space ever. Um, but what, what's your take? Like, how do you, th how are you thinking through this from perspective of like, the tectonic changes in geopolitical landscape and how, and, and how that's affecting you as an investor. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be starting an investment fund if I didn't think that we were up and to the right from here. Um, so that very, that, that idea very much resonates with me. Um, we're also approaching our investment strategy with a very concentrated portfolio strategy and uh which is why we started with a fair you know reasonably small sized fund uh, because we need to deploy it and we also want to deploy it in really high quality projects that um you know can generate you know 100x returns uh because you know because we are you know our, our investors are crypto investors our lps are our are, are crypto lps and so for them to deploy their you know their eth and their bitcoin and and and, and, and these high value assets in um, in a fund, they, they also have to, um, you know, to, to have that, that, um, that conviction that the fund will outperform. So that, um, that resonates with, with our strategy with regards to where we're at and, and the types of things that we're looking at. I think that there still remains a lot of infrastructure to be built. Um, and I feel that, that, that the next cycle is going to be heavily infrastructure focused. So, you know, we've got the um, we've got the initial building blocks of of crypto infrastructure in the form of you know blockchain networks with like a decentralized validator set that allows you to settle and this sort of thing. But the um, the way that that will look in say five years is going to be very different. And I. Um, I take a lot of um, I take a lot of lessons I think from the way the web has um, has sort of abstracted the different layers of its stack, and I see that happening in, in crypto as well. Where you know in in the early two thousands, you know if you wanted to run any 
website, you know, like you had to you know, buy physical server space, install an NOS on there, you know, run a web server, and you were essentially operating all of that infrastructure in one machine, which is sort of what blockchains look like now. But as things went on, all of the, you know, basically the layers of abstraction between an application and 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 the hardware, there's like, you know, perhaps dozens of layers there. And I think that's also happening in crypto. What what we need to keep sort of the, you know, our eye on is is decentralization. And this is why, like the reason we built, the reason we're building this is because we want censorship resistant, um, scalable applications. And we've been, I think, I think the space for a long time, the narrative has been that we need to, de- we need to keep blockchains decentralized and scalable and usable. That doesn't really matter. We've had the around the wrong thing. What we, what we really need is decentralized, scalable, usable applications that are decentralized. And so whatever the stack looks like underneath, I think doesn't really matter so much as long as the applications re- retain those properties. It's the applications that are going to matter. Um, and so we, we, you know, we need to be careful about what, what kind of stack we're building. And one of the things I look here, I, I look at here, for example, is like the fact that, uh, most RPC, uh, providers are centralized, right? Like that is, that's a centralizing point that we need to address. But if, if, if every layer of the stack sort of maintains those properties to some extent, then the applications will also maintain those properties. So anyway, that's a sort of long winded way to say that I think like infrastructure is a big part of what, what will play out in the next cycle and certainly something that interop is like highly um, focused on investing in and where I think a lot of value will continue to come from, right? Like infrastructure has been over the last five years, like sort of the uh, outside of like NFTs and, 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 and sort of things like the uh, infrastructure has been one of the highest returning um, verticals or say, yeah, in, in crypto. And I think that will continue to be the case. Oh, absolutely. I mean, no, no, no doubt. Yeah, without question. And you could just boil it down to the like the conceptual decision tree on infrastructure. Like people people outside of the space always ask me like, why do like dozens of blockchains are worth tens of billions of dollars? And I say because the decision tree on it is a monumental payout. Like you're talking about being the financial substrate of the modern world. That's a multi-trillion dollar outcome so even if it's a 0.01 percent the net present value of that's you know 10 billion dollars that's why these layer ones and some layer twos are efficiently priced at this value it's not it it's not incoherent it's not irrational it's actually very rational because you're talking about literally like the financial substrate of 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 the, the world and beyond over the next you know however many decades, you know, I often say there's never been an industry on planet earth as profitable as programmable money. And within that, the infrastructure layer is where naturally all of the value accrues, uh, uh, or not all the value, but, but the lion's share of the value accrues. If you look at the like top 10 most successful venture outcomes in the space, I think I think Axie is the only one that's not a layer one um, or layer two, you know, and I think that that's a really smart investment strategy, especially in a concentrated fund. Uh, I'd actually like your feedback on the way that we look at, at early stage investing in a slightly different approach in that we have these buckets. So we go conviction, thesis, exposure. Um, generally as buckets. And then we create this long tail across the different buckets. Conviction buckets are larger bets. We've done really deep due diligence. We know the team, they have traction, um, all these things that you would look for. And that's, you know, that's, that's kind of like your traditional venture plays. You have thesis, which, you know, maybe there's like one red flag in there, um, but you like the team. Team is always a, a hard box check in that one. And, and the outcome can be really interesting. And then differently than most venture funds, we have this long tail of exposure. This can be like angel checks, you know, kind of 100 to 300K that usually rest on, is the technology interesting? 
like, is this conceptually a, a massive outlier outcome or, or do you really like the, the founder in question? And we, we leave sort of single digit percentage of the portfolio in our venture book, which is called Resonance, available for these long tail exposure bets that are somewhat experimental and often allow you an option on making a conviction bet later on. So like at the, at the pre-seed, you maybe make this exposure bet because it's a party round and they're only raising a million dollars. So, you know, you, you write the 200 K check and that's really to like get the information to, to then later on make a conviction bet. And in crypto, different from venture. So it, traditional venture would tell you uh, that's a waste of time. But in crypto, because you have shorter timelines to liquidity and because you have much higher deltas in the return profile, right? Like things go very rapidly into the hundreds of X. Um, those exposure bets are actually, in, in, in our view, in our, our analysis, the exposure bets are actually an important part of a coherent crypto portfolio um, because you don't know, you're like, you can't, I have constantly telling my team, like, don't think you're that smart. Um, you don't know what outcome will be a big, a big outcome. And those can be really fast turnarounds and exposure bets. Yeah. That like, I, I love how you think about this because, you know, as a, as a, as a new manager, right? Like, <laughs> I guess, I guess um, the, these are things that, that we're trying to sort of, you know, construct and like put down on paper. I mean, what is our strategy? And uh, I think when you're investing as an angel, um, you you make investment decisions that that affect you and and no one else. And and when you're investing LP's money, you, I think it it forces you to have a little bit deeper um, thinking around how you're constructing your portfolio, how the how these allocations, what what, what portion of your portfolio is allocated with like these convictions or you know these high exposure things. And uh, yeah, this, this is an interesting way to look at it that I'll certainly take back and, and, and probably, uh, you know, um, integrate or in some form into, into, into the way we're constructing our portfolio. But, that, but I think, you know, when we, you know, we, have, we haven't like sort of expressed it that way, but it, it, does, it does, I think, it resemble a lot of, uh, the way in which we have been thinking about how we want to construct our portfolio. Right? Like we have these things that are, you know, super high conviction and then we have a smaller part of the portfolio that, you know, we, we've sort of labeled like these high risk, more like high risk bets. Um, and you know, some, something in the middle there. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's cool to know that you're also thinking about it this way. And so built, built your portfolio press strategy around it. I'm happy to send you some analysis that we've done on this. Um, Fantastic. To, to just look at it. Cause again, it, you know, it's not, it's not like normal venture. Like this flies in the face of a lot of the long held tenants of normal venture. Yeah. So we, we had so many other things to discuss here, but I just realized we're way over time. Uh, but I do want to talk about your, your work in psychedelics a little bit. And I know you've been, you've been wanting to talk about this uh, as well. So you're also one of the founders of Vine uh, VC, which is a, a, a VC firm that, is focused on like health and uh, and wellness and, and and consciousness and and certainly um, psychedelics. Um, you know what what are some of forward thinking things you're seeing in this space and what's your involvement with Maps, uh, this uh, multi uh, disciplinary association for psychedelics, psychedelic science, yeah. 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 yeah, science, yeah. It started. It, it, just very quickly, it, it started when I, I went with a friend of mine to uh, to Peru. Uh, he was dealing with a really de debilitating addiction problem. And I saw the transformation that he went through. And I kind of went like, okay, like something's going on here. This isn't just people tripping out in the forest. Um, you know, mental health is a massive, is the largest pandemic that mankind faces um, before the pandemic um, one in five people suf suffer from mental health problems. I think post pandemic, it's probably close to maybe 40% of the globe. Um, so this is a problem and SSRIs are not doing the, the, are not a solution. And I think, you know, for many people who have tried a psychedelic therapy of any kind that you realize that it's, it's a wonderful experience, both for curing the sick as well as betterment of the well. 
And so I just kind of wanted to like learn more about this. So I, I spun up a, a very small, separate experimental um, fund in, in Vine, which is now kind of, it got really slippery and took a long, it took a lot on a life of its own. And we've been fortunate enough to back some really interesting things in mental health. So like um, you should try Othership if, if you can, if it's in your, in your area, it's a, a community and people in crypto would really resonate with Othership using holotropic breath work and hot cold therapies um, to plus community to like take a new approach to mental health. Um, but the most sort of the highest conviction bet that we made certainly was in MAPS. Um, so MAPS is the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Science. Um, 37 years as a nonprofit led by Rick Doblin to bring um, MDMA over the line um, uh, of FDA approval. They will get that FDA approval by February, March of next year, and then they can actually legally sell uh, MDMA in North America for PTSD. But very quickly, I think you'll see the dominoes fall for depression as well as couples therapy. MDMA for, I funded a study in couples therapy a couple years ago, and the results are shocking um, of how effective it is for, for, for couples going through various challenges. Um, you know, generally I just like, I, I didn't look at this as like a for-profit thing because again, like we work in the most profitable industry on the planet, right? Like if I want to make money, I'll go for crypto, right? Like, you know, nothing's more profitable than programmable money. Um, I just looked at it as kind of an exploration, uh, project that where I wanted to be a good custodian of LP capital. I'm very grateful for the LPs that have supported Vine and very, you know, um, very happy and very optimistic about the the returns that they they will have. But, you know, ultimately just playing around on the capital model um, because these are, you know, this is the largest problem that mankind faces. Um, and MAPS is unquestionably the leading organization They've been a nonprofit and I would like them to be able to stay a nonprofit because I think the social experiment of a nonprofit leading a novel pharmaceuticals category is really important. Um, uh, I think if we could prove to the world that you don't need these 20 year patents and pharma margins and the whole pharma industrial complex to deliver life changing therapy, I think that that really matters. Um, and so I designed a SPV for maps last year, which I led, um, and we would raise a bit under $50 million. Uh, and, and what that was, was a, a revenue share. So you could, as a for-profit investor, you could, you could make money as, you know, maps has, has increasing revenues, but then there is a reciprocity component to it. So as you make more money, as you go, you know, two X and five X and, and eight, you know, eight X. Uh, MOIC on your return, you give progressively more back to MAPS, the organization, so they can stay nonprofits, so they can fund other other research and other philanthropic entities. And we're kind of coming up to, um, to MAPS needing to do another fundraise to get to the point of sustainability. Um, they would need probably around another 60 to 80. And I have started to think about, you know, how much overlap there is in crypto and, and psychedelics. Like these are my two life's two passions. And I've constantly tried to keep them apart and not have any interaction between the two areas. Um, but we saw a glimpse of how much the two communities love each other in the Christie sale last year, where we did a digital art sale with Christie's for the benefit of maps and all, it, it was just amazing. The, the artists that showed out for that. Um, and that kind of got me thinking of like, okay, are there things that we could be doing to to have the, the crypto community engage um, further? And I think this would be an important moment for crypto to support a company like this, um, in part because we have a narrative problem in crypto right now that the outside world thinks that all we are is a bunch of like Ponzi scammer, you know, profiteers that are just interested in the speculative use case. And so supporting something that really matters, that really moves the, the, the ball forward for mankind 
solving, you know, arguably the largest problem that mankind faces, the mental health pandemic, um, I think could be really, really compelling. And then the joke that I've made with Rick is, you know, when we originally designed the the regenerative financing vehicle um, uh, last year for for MAPS, it was like 40 pages to have this reciprocity pledge um, in the actual company in, in the vehicle. And I was like, you know, this is like a few dozen lines of code in a smart contract. Like, like you know, in crypto, this is like, you know, refi and decide, like these things are like native and natural to us. Where in, in like the traditional pharma industrial complex, they're like, nah, this is crazy. Like you're gonna like give profits back to a different organization on a program basis. I'm like, yeah, because if you just ask somebody at the end of the day to give a philanthropic donation after they've made a hundred X on investment, they'll write you a 25 K check and tell you to go fuck off. Right. Um, and, and so you have to program it in. It has to be like baked into the incentive model. And that's trivial, that's trivially available in crypto. So I've been trying to think around, you know, there's, I'm not here announcing anything. I'm just sort of like thinking through like, okay, what could be a, a model that provides cash flows to investors, like provides a really compelling venture outcome, but has this reciprocity baked in? You know, could we draw on the crypto community to support this this fundamentally important organization that has done the most to push psychedelic um, therapies forward a, a, across the world? And um, and it, you know, and then could we kickstart uh, regenerative financing as like a new DeFi summer, but have refi summer, and we're doing more you know more good for the world um, outside of 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 you know, of, of just pure, pure profits. Um, could we kickstart real, like decentralized science and in supporting something like this? And I feel like, you know, not to be too hyperbolic, but I feel like crypto needs maps and maps needs crypto and the two belong together, even though I've tried to keep them apart for as long as I've been involved with both. Um, so that was a bit long winded, my apologies, but, but Yeah. No, it's super cool, and I mean, certainly, you know, the the psychedelic space is is one that I think, yeah, I think you're right. Like there 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 are a lot of synergies with the crypto space, and certainly people in crypto, I think, um, are more likely to have done psychedelics than most other uh, people in most other uh, industries. So, um, it, I think it makes sense that uh, that 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 maps and and crypto sort of you know, come together in some, in some form or fashion. It seems, uh, it seems, seems quite natural. And, uh, yeah, I do, I do also like agree that the mental health p pandemic, as, as you call it, it is, it feels like it's, it's getting worse. And, and I think COVID accelerated it, but also what's going on in the world right now, I think is certainly not helping. And, um, any way that we have to come back from that, um, is, uh, is a is good for net net positive for, for humanity. Yeah, a lot of the things that are happening in the world that are terrible for humanity are functions of uh, of mental health. Like, why is uh, Russia in Ukraine? Because Putin sat in a basement for two and a half years, you know, only allowing people to sit on the other side of a thirty foot table from him in his own, you know, in his own thought cycle, just stewing away until he convinced himself that he was going to like reunite the, the, the former USSR. Like that's a mental health issue. And you go right down the list of so many other things that are like world leaders have us, have us on these like insane uh, misadventures and they come down to mental health problems, right? This is a, this is, you know, with the exception of death, this is the largest problem that mankind faces. Maybe for a different time, we could dive, dive yeah, into that. Yeah, I think we will need to do another one, like deep, deep into maps and, and, and psychedelics uh, for, for Epicenter spinoff podcast uh, about psychedelics. <laughs> so broadly, I'm looking for feedback right now from the community. Like, you know, is this something that the community wants to get behind? Like, we do need to come through for maps. That, like, somebody's got to got to write this check. Like, there's no way we're going to let this 37-year um, journey of Rick Doblin, like die at this precipice moment, right? Or, or even have like a, you know, a pharma VC come in and own it in the end. And it's like, all this was for naught. Um, that doesn't seem like the outcome that, 
we we've been waiting for. Um, and so I, I do think I am optimistic that, that there's a, important synergy to be realized between crypto and maps. I haven't cracked the nut of what that is yet, um, but would just love the community's feedback. Cool. Well, Ryan, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, it's been a pleasure Thank you chatting guys. with you on all of these topics. Uh, I'd love to have, have you on again at some point. Maybe not in 250 episodes, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? The important thing is, I know that you guys are going to be around in 250 episodes because you do great work. You're as, as good as I hope so. in space. <laughs> and, we're, and we're super grateful for, uh, for everything you do. Thanks, Ryan. Cool. Well, thanks again. And uh, I do, I do want to, I do want to plug one thing before we go, uh, just because we didn't have any sponsors today. So it feels fitting. So, uh, Nebular Summit, it is happening and it's happening in Paris on July 24th and 25th. So Nebular Summit is the Interchain Builders Conference. It's two days. It's going to be, Epic, uh, for anybody who was there last year, and I know Felix, you were there last year, so I, I know you can, you can vouch for this, um, that, uh, Nebula Summit is probably one of the best events, in, events, events in Europe for interchain builders. So anything related to Cosmos, interoperability, uh, Cosmos DeFi, um, and, uh, Cosmosm, um, staking, et cetera. Uh, so this year we're doing it again. It's going to be two days. It's, uh, it's happening at this place called Albert School in central Paris. Uh, which uh, maintains is, is larger than our venue last year, but you know tries to keep the very cool vibe that we had at last year's venue. And tickets are on sale, so the early bird tickets went on sale um, on Monday, April third, and we still have some available. So I think by the time this goes out, there'll probably be some uh, very few early bird tickets left. So if you plan on being at ECC this year, you should definitely uh, get a ticket to Nebular Summit. It's going to be great, and um, we've already got you know something like fifteen speakers lined up, and probably will go up to. 70, 80 speakers. So yeah, that's happening. And uh, we'd love to see all of you there if you can make it. So thanks again for joining us this week. And we'll talk to you in next week's episode.